meeting to order. We have a number of um, items today. Uh, why don't we start off with public comment. Um, LaCour Alpern, general public comment. Just a, a quick announcement. Uh, Welcome. Councilman, thank you. Uh, AQMD will be hosting our annual Cleaner Awards luncheon uh, next uh, Friday afternoon, uh, 11.30 a.m. Okay. at the uh, Beltmore Hotel here in downtown L.A. Uh, all elected officials in the area are invited to attend with a complimentary ticket, so hopefully um, members of the Energy Environment Committee and uh, other council members will join us just a few blocks away for lunch uh, next uh, Friday. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great announcement. Thank you for passing out the flyer as well. Let's begin with uh, item number one, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Rafi Operator with the CLA's office. Item number one relates to DWP report relative to new electric vehicle service rider and experimental alternative maritime power rate schedule. We have a staff report from DWP as well as uh, and with assistance, Port of LA. Okay. okay, Welcome. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Phil Leiber, Chief Financial Officer of the Department, and I'll be just providing a few uh, comments about the proposed rate alternatives that we're offering customers. Uh, for your consideration today, we have an experimental alternative maritime power rate. This is an interruptible rate that would be offered to large ships that come to the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, this rate would be available for five years. This is an enhancement. It's an additional option to what we have in place today. And second, we have an electric vehicle service rider for, to encourage electric vehicle charging. With regard to the first item, uh, the AMP rate, this has been developed after many months of collaboration with the Port and the Department. It is a rate that allows large cruise ships to come to Los Angeles, use our power while in port, and thereby help meet uh, clean air requirements. It's a rate structure that makes sense both for the port and their customers and for the department. Uh, just a brief description of the rate. It does provide a $10,000 a month minimum charge. It compensates the utility for the cost of providing service. There is no demand charge, as is the case with the existing AMP rate. In exchange, we would receive a slightly higher energy charge than the existing AMP rate provides. All in, uh, based on expected consumption levels, we think this will provide a rate of about 17 cents per kilowatt hour, which is workable for the port and their customers, and also recovers the cost of the department. Uh, in exchange for this new rate structure, uh, the rate would be uh, interruptible. So with a 10-minute notice, we could contact the port and tell the tell them that the department is short on power and we need the ship to revert back to using its onboard generation. And because of this arrangement, the department is covering its costs. We don't have to go out and build additional capacity to serve these uh, customers. And if we are short, again, we can just curtail the load. So it's really a win for the department. It's a win for the port and a win for their customers and the local economy. So. Uh, it promotes business. Cruise ships do have alternatives. They don't have to come to L.A. They can come to Long Beach. They can come to other ports. Having them continue to be able to come to Los Angeles and provide a benefit to the lo local economy is something we think is good for everyone. It does reduce air pollution. Our resources are much cleaner than the onboard generators of the ship. And it also makes good use of the department's energy resources. Uh, having the ability to curtail customers when there's a system emergency is very valuable to the department. This gives us that option. So we think this makes sense for all involved. Thank you. For the record, we've been joined by Councilmember Tony Cardenas. And does that complete the presentation? No? That yes. completes my presentation. Um, item number one. Okay. Any questions or comments? Uh, on the EV, what, what's the rationale behind the $10 month, minimum monthly charge? Uh, so that was on the AMP. For, for the electric vehicles, 
Uh, the department will be offering a number of options for uh, owners and operators of electric vehicles uh, to take advantage of different rate structures that suit, the, suit their needs. So currently, there's two approaches they can use. They can just use the standard residential rate structure today, plug in. They're not going to get any particular discount for charging their vehicle. They can charge it whenever they want. Uh, the other option right now is they can go to a time of use meter, and they do receive a, a discount for that uh, of two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, but uh, they can only charge up to 500 kilowatt hours a month. What we're proposing here is a third option to further encourage uh, the adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, so here, they would get, continue to get a 2.5 cent per kilowatt hour discount, but they would have to charge uh, during off-peak periods, 8 p.m. to 10 a.m., uh, weekdays and all day and weekends. Uh, they would use, need to get a dedicated time of use meter specific to the EV charging. Uh, there would be no additional service charges for the meter, but to compensate our costs, uh, we would have a $10 minimum usage charge because uh, there are some fixed costs involved in providing the service. So again, it's just another choice for our customers. Um, it would be an interruptible rate, uh, just like for the AMP. So if, for whatever reason, the department is short on power, we could turn off uh, these chargers, and uh, there's a benefit to the department for being able to do that. So here again, it's a rate that we think makes good sense for the customers, uh, makes sense for the, custom for the department, recovers our costs, and just another option for our customers. Great. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Corex just walked in. Mr. Corex, we just uh, finished up item number one. Do you have any questions or comments on number one? I do not. Okay, so we'll move that item. Uh, approve that. Approved. Uh, without objection. So, co colleagues, if you could, um, I was going to put item two. Four and eight on consent. Is that okay? Yep. Two, four, okay. Eight. Yeah. Two, four, and eight consent. And we're going to continue item six and seven. So that leaves us with three, five, three, and five. Six and seven, we have public speaker cards, but we're going to continue those. Yeah. Okay, you have a speaker card on number four. Okay. So we'll take a speaker card on number four. Six and seven will be continued. We have two speaker cards on those, but those are going to be continued. Okay? On item number four, we have one public speaker, Mark Vela. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Vela, and I'm the Economic Development Deputy for Council President Herb Wesson. I'm here to tell you that our office supports item number four, supports the motion, and the recommendations to sub subdivide the property at 6,000 Jefferson and to appraise the property. Uh, our office is, has a negotiation with the developer at this time and have plans to develop that property. Great. Thank you very much. We'll send that uh, consent. Okay. So without objection, we'll send those items consent and continued. And now item number three. Item number three, DWP report relative to the Scattergood Generating Station Unit 3 repairing project. Staff from DWP as well as the CAO's office. Good afternoon, council members. My name Good is afternoon. Louis Ting. I am the project manager for the Scattergood repairing project for the Department of Water and Power. We're here to ask for approval of ordinance to allow a water and power to let a contract through using the proposal, seal proposal method. And Scattergo repairing project, um, Scattergo generation, it's unit three has been put in service since 1978. And the unit generates about 460 megawatts gross. And it's, it's in need of uh, uh, replacing and repower and one of the objectives is to take off ocean once through cooling, and another objective is to satisfy the SCA QMD's um, settlement agreement that we had uh, with AQMD back in 2000. And also, this is this what substantially reduce the use of ocean water, and also improve reliability for the west side, which is uh, supported the the, uh, the the much needed uh, uh, voltage support 
out on the west side. And this repairing project will consist of either a combined cycle unit, which is a gas turbine and steam turbine, and also two simple cycle units to also integrate with intermittent renewable sources. Uh, this also, uh, or potentially if we, depending on which type of technology we select, uh, we can also have two combined cycle units with fast start capability, which also will have integrate with renewable resources. Thank you very much. Um, what is the capacity comparison between the current plant and the rebuilt version? Is it a Capac one for one or megawatt trade-off? Yes, there, there's no megawatt. We're gonna we're gonna me we're gonna repower megawatt for megawatt. The current plant generates 830 megawatts total, and at the end of the unit three repowering, we are still gonna have 830 megawatts total. So, the current unit three generates 460 megawatt total but we're going to repower up to 590 megawatts, depending on technology we select. And what we'll do is we'll derate unit one, which is much less efficient than the units will be repowered, so that the, the unit one will be operating at less capacity. Okay. And how do you anticipate taking lessons learned from this plant development project and applying them to future plant repowerings? Um, we already taken lessons learned from uh, the Valley Generating Station repowering, also the Haynes uh, combined cycle repowering project, we took in those lessons learned applied to this current repowering project, which reflects in our um, our specifications, the technical specification, also the commercial specifications. We have taken those lessons learned also from, from the Pine Tree Wind project, which I was the project manager of. We have taken those lessons learned uh, through the EPC process, okay. the engineer, and your construct, design, build. The primary drivers for completing this is the uh, once through cooling regulations, and there's other air quality mandates. Yes. Um, and also, we want to integrate our renewable resources. Um, and the project has a diversity of objectives uh, with a basic need as well, just to modernize. But uh, at what point do you believe you'll be able to assess the progress in your power replacement plan so as to determine the future, uh, the full capacity of this for future repowerings? What we have done is part of the IRP 2011 IRP, that units one and two will also be powered right after this project is completed. So by our goal is by 2020, units one and two will also be repowered with a similar technology that we're currently looking at. So that will be done. So the entire Scattergood um, generating station will be repowered by 2020. That's the goal right now. Excellent. Okay, any questions, comments? Mr. Koretz? Uh, you mentioned that Scattergood has the capability of uh, integrating renewable resources. Yes. I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit and give us an idea of what percentage will will be utilizing uh, renewables. It, it, uh, absolutely. Um, let me backtrack one step. This Haynes repairing project that's currently going on right now, we're actually installing 600 megawatts worth of simple cycle unit that can have megawatts in 10 minutes, meaning from the minute the operator start the units, we will have 600 megawatts in 10 minutes. At Scattergood, we'll also have the capability for two of the units that we're looking at. Um, there also will have 200 megawatts, up to 200 megawatts in 10 minutes. That means the minute that you press the button start, initial start command for the, for the units, it will have 200 megawatts in 10 minutes. And that means that any time there's, there's a variable in the wind or solar or geothermal, whatever, the, renewable resources we have, it will be able to integrate with that. Okay. A a any idea, though, what percentage that is of the total I I'm power sorry. generated? We can have, um, um, we'll, we'll look into that, but a as far as right now, I don't have that number. I'm just focusing just on this ordinance right now for the category Parm project. And based on the integrated resource plan that we have in 2011, this is, this is part, this is needed for the, the, uh, the future renewable resources that we're going to have. Tell them how long it takes to repower the, them now. If it's, you're saying it's taking it to, to 10 minutes? Yes. How much does it currently take? Oh, currently, it, the unit three will take from the minute we want to start a unit, for unless if on a cold start, it might take up to three days to fully get the load for, to, um, to generate a full load. So we'd be going from three days to a few minutes. minutes. That's pretty remarkable. Yes. I'm sorry to understand your question, but yes. Thank you. Mr. Carnes, any questions? Nope. Okay, we have one public speaker card. Uh, William Ernest Shenark. 
Welcome. Okay, I'm William Ernest Shinnewark. I've spoken at the other board meetings. I'm a licensed engineer, mechanical engineer, and FAA a and I have in my hands what I believe is a California Renewable Energy Death Certificate. FERC requested suspension of California greenhouse gas trading plans. Apparently, out-of-state electricity generators gagged on unacceptable penalties for resource shuffling. Electricity comes without serial numbers, so the source cannot be traced. A quarter of California's electricity comes from out-of-state. It's not too hard to extrapolate that AB 32 will be just as unenforceable as its carbon cap and trade. Electricity has no serial number. Investments in renewable energy will collapse in the face of seven cents a kilowatt hour power from airplane motors. At seven cents a kilowatt hour, renewable energy investments will struggle to pay property taxes, insurance, land rents, and major repairs. A roughly half billion dollars for the scatter good repowering is wasted because non existent renewable energy generation will not need backup. Now Los Angeles wants to spend $1,000 per person, $4 billion total on renewable energy. This is a highly regressive tax. Apparently, Measure B results are being ignored. The city council gagged on the last three cent a kilowatt hour rate increase. Air quality may be worse if upwind backup power replaces downwind coal power. Renewable energy and associated backup power may use as much natural gas as combined cycle gas turbines producing all the power. And renewable energy may actually have negative environmental benefits relative to burning coal because Mexico is projected to become a net importer of LNG. And I've already bought my planet destroyer. Hmm. Thank you. Well, without objection, we'll move this item forward. Next, Next item. item. Thank you. Number five, CO report relative to execution of personal services contract with Clean Harbors Environmental Services. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Dan Myers, Bureau of Sanitation, Solid Resources, Citywide Recycling Division. The item before you today is the execution of a personal service contract with Clean Harbors Environmental Services uh, as the primary contractor to operate the city's residential special materials program, also known as our Household Hazardous Waste Program. Our Household Hazardous Waste Program is a very extensive program designed to ensure the proper disposal of residential special materials, such as batteries, used motor oil, paint, pesticides, e-waste, and sharps. The city maintains a comprehensive program that consists of the operation of six safe centers located throughout the city. The seventh safe center is actually due to open in uh, actually the end of this month, uh, October 27th, seventh safe center will be open, as well as battery collections at all city libraries, over 200 locations, as well as sharps collections at 37 locations, including 24 senior citizen facilities and four city facilities, including City Hall East, City Hall South, uh, and the Marvin Browdy Building next to the Van Nuys City Hall. The city also maintains 15 marina used oil collection sites, uh, holds over 20 used oil collection events, six annual e-waste collection events, and two, uh, typically two mobile residential uh, special material collection programs per year. Uh, the the contract or the proposed contract uh, for you today uh, has a term of five years with two three year renewal options with a contract ceiling for the entire eleven year term of fifty three million dollars. The city expends uh, approximately four million dollars a year for the operation of our RSM program. Currently, the the primary contractor is Philip Service Contracts and the backup contractor, we maintain both a primary and backup. Since we're dealing with household hazardous waste, we need to ensure that if anything happens with our primary contractor, we are in a uh, place to quickly respond. So we always maintain a backup contract. 
um, through, uh, through the release of an RFP and the evaluation, the prime and backup actually swapped through the process. We're proposing that Clean Harbors become the primary contract and we'll be following up with a backup contract with Phillips Service Contracting. Um, there's actually um, a slight correction. I, I think uh, Mr. Poon will address that in the CAO report. Um, the initial evaluation of uh, Phillips Service Contracting uh, stated that they did not pass the good faith effort. They submitted an appeal and the Board of Public Works upheld that appeal. So essentially uh, paving the way for uh, PSE or Phillips Service Contracting to be a backup contractor. Uh, the, the CIO report reflected the initial bureau recommendations uh, and not the, the final board action. I believe uh, Mr. Wilson from the CIO's office will address that. Yeah, we, we, we agree. We're okay with that. Okay. Is there any, enough money in our, this is all specially funded, correct? The, uh, this program is all special funded. And there's insufficient funding in those special funds so that we don't run out and have to turn to our general fund? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Kretz? Yeah, I see what the contract uh, requires Clean Harbors to do, but I'm, I'm not sure that everybody knows that we have these kinds of collections. So I wonder how much of a additional focus we can put on marketing these programs. Uh, that's that's um, that's always our goal is to promote our programs. Uh, primarily, advertisement for our program is done through the website. Um, on a semi-annual basis, we run uh, an environmental ad in the newspaper uh, that promotes these programs. Uh, you're right, not everybody knows about the program, but they are very well attended. Through our safe centers, uh, last year we serviced uh, approximately 70,000 residents. Um, but we're always looking for additional ways to get the word out. Uh, we really want to continue to promote not only our safe centers, but the newer components, such as the senior citizen facilities for the collection of sharps. Yeah, are there other things we could be doing? Do we send out press releases to uh, local papers and patches and places that might run the information just uh, as they, they seek uh, easy news to fill their pages? I, yes, I'm, I am, I'm positive there's, there is more we could do. Typically whenever the, the program rolls out, we do do press releases. Um, but there, there probably is more we can do. Uh, we, we haven't yet addressed any of the, the social media. That's, that's the next thing we, we want to look at. Um, we, we have tried it with our, um, our apartment recycling program, uh, establishing a, a Facebook page as well as a Twitter. And we're gonna be looking to roll some of that out to our other programs, such as the residential special materials program. And even some of the really easy things, uh, like individual city council offices, almost everybody has an e-newsletter. And if there are upcoming dates for some of these things, uh, I'm sure uh, if you contact the various council offices where they're taking place, um, it would be very easy to put blurbs about that uh, in the e-newsletters. Uh, it would be something that we'd all, I'm sure, happily do and easily get the word out to to people that are very focused on, on community uh, events. We'll be happy to follow through with that. That'd be great. The only other question I have is, um, I understand that some e-waste now gets uh, uh, shipped to China and is sometimes sold. Um, are there things we could do with our e-waste to actually have the city uh, uh, create a little additional revenue from that as well? Uh, well, actually, right now, um, we maintain two contracts, one for the, the operation of the Residential Special Materials Program, the one we're talking about today, and we maintain a separate e-waste contract. And we do that specifically to address those concerns. All e-waste that's collected by the city uh, 
has to be broken down into commodity level by our contractors. That means it's broken down to the metals, plastics, uh, precious metals, uh, broken down to commodity levels. No whole units per our contract requirements can be shipped out. By doing so, we avoid almost all of the issues that come from shipping whole units out, uh, out of the country where they can be improperly handled or disposed of. We avoid that. Uh, and through our e-waste contract, we generate approximately $250,000 a year in revenue. Uh, through our new e-waste contracts, which I'm hoping to bring to this council uh, within the next two months, that's going to increase by another $175,000 uh, because of our negotiations through, the, uh, through an RFP process. Very good. So it sounds like you're already on top of those concerns and doing exactly what I might have suggested <laughs> you do. So I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So we'll approve this item, send it to council. And I believe that ends all our items. We do have one public comment card. We had a public comment at the beginning of the meeting, but I will reopen public comment. Uh, the gentleman here has paid for parking. I want to make sure that you came down here to... Yes, you don't have any parking except starting at $8. Why do you pay parking at $8? Where, where, is that like the going rate around Across here? Across from immigration behind... The old LAPD building. Wow. It's a flat fee? Yeah. All day. All day. It's the only place you can do it. Okay. Wayne Spindler. Yes. Uh, you had two items a day, items six and seven, which I thought you'd get to, but you tabled it. Both of these are involving residents, long-time residents, with sewer service charges on their water bills that they're being unfairly and unjustly billed. One is a relatively poor lady living in CD14, and the other is a well-to-do corporation in CD5. Both of them are raising the same issue. How far back can you go to get a refund of your sewer service charges when you find out that you've been taken to the cleaners? The department says one year, that you can only go back and you have to report your discrepancy within one year. Now, in the case of item seven, they had had a meter that was placed on their property. The department admitted they should have never charged a sewer service charge ever on it, and it's been deemed to be exempt. Yet the department only wanted to go back two years, and the, co the company wanted to go back to 1987, the day they put the meter in the first time, and get back all of the sewer service charges going back that far retroactively. The second one involves a woman, and I, I emailed number six's petition to Ron K at Ron K at his website because I thought it was heartbreaking. I don't know if you read her letter. She hand wrote a letter that she has a small duplex and that her pipe had broken, but she didn't know why. All this water was being used and the bills were coming into thousands of dollars. Finally, they discovered it was a water breakage. They repaired it. Then she got the bill and it was several thousand dollars and she had to pay it, now she can't afford it, and the department went through all these machinations to decide that because it was happened between 2008 and 2009, because she got her paperwork in the, in the next year, that she could not get the money back. And this is the type of thing that you guys need to deal with, is allowing customers who raise issues that, like this to get their money back refunded without hiding behind a one-year statute of limitations. So a statute of limitations, every statute of limitations has equity built in it in terms of when you can find out or when you should have found out what the discrepancy was. And in both six and seven, I would strongly urge you to approve their requests and grant them back a full refund of their charges. Great. Thank you very much. And we've continued those items to have further review. And uh, thank you for your comments. They're very helpful. Okay. Take them into consideration. Thank you. So with no objection, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Stop by? Yeah. yeah.